Over the years, I've frequently said that I have only seven white friends. At times, the numbers have dropped to four when we're not doing diligence and fighting against racism for racial social justice in this apartheid community. Today, I'm with three white friends. I invite to share their perspective on issues dealing with related to dis deconstructing whiteness. And also, there are many books out there to talk about whiteness. However, for the sake of time, we will only explore the questions from our guests today. We have th three individuals, Sister Cynthia Ruby, uh, Riley Wilson, J.D., and Cynthia Ramirez, also Larry Meyer, and each person will bring a unique perspective to this discussion. Um, one of the things that I like to do is to say, when I work with charities, racists oftentimes want to attack my personal views by jeopardizing my employment as if I was a spokesperson for the agency or organization when I was speaking as an individual or, or, or person in general. And I think what we need to be talking about sometimes is freedom of speech and freedom of thought when we talk about some of these issues. There are many ways to keep people on plantations or in, in situations they won't want to be in this state, country, and community by jeopardizing when they speak the truth to power. So what I've asked each panel member, if they could just say briefly a little bit more about themselves and identify how they want to identify themselves, then we can go right into the questions. The format is I will interview them or talk to them for about 30 minutes. We may go a little bit over because it was late starting up, and then we'll give the participants uh, the rest of the program just to kind of raise questions, comments, and so on. And I did ask each person to kind of keep their responses uh, somewhat briefly. So let's get going and rock and roll. So I guess who would like to start first as a panel? Will you say a little bit more about yourself and then we can go into the questions? Yes. Okay. I'll start. My name is Cynthia Ruby, and I am a Catholic sister. At this time in my life, I am a, a part-time substitute teacher. And I've been reading any book that comes along around this topic. And Ajmal edits what I say. Pass it on to Cynthia Lindenmeyer. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm coming to you from South Florida where it is actually colder than it is there. Uh, I've known Ajmal going on 10 years and really passionate about this topic. I, I work in the university and Ajima and I are actually co-leading, well, he's doing most of the leading, uh, facilitating a book discussion on my grandmother's hands. And it's it's been, that's been going really well. So honored to be here with y'all. Next, right. Hello everybody, my name is Riley Wilson. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I am the, I serve as the secretary of the board um, for more. So good. Let me start off, and I'm the keep sequence. And sometimes I get confused. I'm going to ask each panel member in a sequence of questions. And the way the format also is that we will have towards the end of our discussion a chance if they want to come back and ask each other questions or raise additional points. But I'm going to start off with uh, Cynthia uh, Ramirez, and I want to ask her. I hosted and facilitated many table talk discussions about racial issues white privilege, and attempted to deconstruct whiteness in both the academic setting and private conversation. You're familiar with in the video called The Color of Fear, Victor Lewis asked one of the participants, what it means? What does it mean to be white? And can you define whiteness? You know, there's so many different ways to answer um, that. Uh, and you can answer that from a collective human race consciousness perspective, historical, textbook, cultural power structure. So for me, I'm going to answer this from a uh, a metaphysical perspective, understanding that we all live in the reality where it's just a dualistic worldview where ego dominates our operative consciousness. So for me, um, I define whiteness as this dualistic premise that has led to a false social construct narrative, and it's it's fueled by an unbalanced collective and individual consciousness driven by uh, the reptilian brain aspect of the ego. And the ramifications of that are, we see the inequities in education, the legal system, housing, job opportunities, as evidenced by um, a caste system, exemplified by slavery, redlining, segregation. And so being white also means having an invisible privilege that uh, one is really is unaware of until um, there becomes a decision point, some like aha moment where you realize that you're like that proverbial fish swimming in water. And 
like historically, I know that whiteness wasn't even a thing until about 400 years ago when uh, the whole the race consciousness began to assign color and it had meaning. And I, for me, the aha moment was when I read the book uh, Color of Water by James McBride. Good. Now I'm going to follow up, Sister uh, uh, Cynthia. We, we faced many racial and issues, identities related to being white, Italian, Irish, Latino, Chicano, Greek, so on. As a child or youth growing up in a white home, as opposed to the White House, it's kind of a joke. Did your parents or other adults in your family talk about racial issues? And have you been in the presence of racist comments or insults? And can you cite where you either challenged or ignored it and so on? And are there secret codes or issues that white teach other folks about dealing with race issues? So it's kind of a multifaceted question, but answer anyone you want and how you want to go at it. <laughs> I'm going to start by saying that I grew up on a plantation, but our plantation was a farmhouse that was white with a little bit of paint because it didn't necessarily have running water when it started. So we worked on that plantation rented farm um, and we did not benefit, the landlord did. So I relate a very tiny bit to that plantation comment that you made earlier. So my ethnic identity experience um, is very generational that I want to share. The white home that I grew up in did not include any family talk about racial issues. My ethnic origin is European, specifically from the kingdom of Bohemia, very proud people. But we were conquered as a people by the Germanic tribes many years back. The derogatory term for us was bohunk. So if we wanted to insult one another or somebody else, we'd call them a bohunk. But that word bohunk also had a positive side. So if you were called bohemian, it meant that you were free-spirited and unconventional. And I believe I have, um, my life has been shaped by both meanings. For my dad, he attended a German school they taught English in the school, but on the playground, it was the German against the Czech or Bohemians They go by both names. And so on the playground, he often experienced inferiority and negative comments like being called a bohunk. And that created a sense of inferiority for him, which I believe passed on in my own siblings. There's seven of us. Uh, physically in this um, system, if you were blue eyed and blonde hair, you were preferred and the way you looked physically. So all my dad's family had these blue gray eyes and my mother's family included the brown eyes. So she had a brown eyed dad and uh, her twin sister was blue eyed and blonde hair. So preferred in that setting. She had one brother with brown eyes and two brothers with the blue gray eyes. And you wonder, well, okay, so what's the difference? Well, in that system for my grandmother, my dad's mom, um, she had a hard time accepting my br the brown-eyed wife that my dad chose. Mm -hmm. And then when the first two grandkids were uh, brown-eyed, there were comments. So the other five kids all had blue eyes, so that made everything balanced out. Um, so I share this smallest in, uh, illustration because that was my experience of bias and prejudice within that German Bohemian or German Czech culture. Um, although my mom often felt imprisoned by the hidden life of being a farm wife, she motivated us seven children to experience life with opportunities. We had freedom to play and freedom to work on this rented plantation farm. Never thought about it until Ajmal talked about that. So she taught us to be silent in the face of uh, this kind of treatment, and we learned to ignore it and not let it become self-defining. The second part I want to share is about the black farmer. I'm going to move a little quicker, but I want to just ask you specifically, did they talk about race in your family, about black, white, any of that like that growing up? Did you get that directly from many of your relatives? You said the, the color of the eyes and so on. I would say we were colorblind. Growing up in your in the rural community, okay. And then the other sure. I mean, the other question, real quick, I want to ask you is: Was there ever any secret codes? In other words, there's a word called dog whistle. So, was there any time when somebody said something in a secret way that only you would know in your family when you're talking about these other groups or anything like that in your ethnic or racial community in the rural area? 
Was there anything like that? Do you remember anybody saying any sly remarks about, was there like Hispanics in your community or Asians or Native Americans? Would you get any of that feedback? None of that. Okay. That's, that's okay. Yeah. We're a very European um, rural settlement in Nebraska. Okay, good. Yeah, because we're chasing time a little bit, and I want to make sure we get other folks into this conversation. Let's switch up a little bit. Riley, I want to get to you, if I can. As a younger person, as contrast to us and as you as a white male, what would you see or do to help reduce the level of racism and strive for more racial equality in our divided society? Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I notice is um, th there is a divide, I think, generationally between how we view uh, um, kind of what progress looks like um, versus in the past. And so, um, as I think most of us know, um, racism doesn't go away, obviously, white supremacy doesn't go away, it just kind of changes over time, how it's presented, and it, and it presents itself in different ways. Uh, most recently, you've seen different um, buzzwords kind of used um, as kind of racist dog whistles, as you mentioned, Ajumal, things like critical race theory and DEI and things like that being used essentially as a proxy um, to um, speak about people of color, Black people in particular, I think. And so I think um, it's incumbent upon us to be able to identify that in real time when it's happening and be able to point out that it's not, um, these things aren't per se different than they were in the past. They're just being presented in a, in a light that is maybe for some more ex uh, socially acceptable. Um, if you can present the racism in a way that uh, makes it seem as if, you know, when we're talking about critical race theory, we're trying to indoctrinate children. It seems like it's an issue about childhood education rather than racism. When you talk about DEI, um, it, it allows those folks who have that prerogative to make it seem as if this is an issue talking about uh, fairness in the workplace. And really, it's, it's a, racist, a, a racism issue. So um, I, I think it's important that we recognize that as time moves on. And um, I think younger people, to kind of get back to that, tend to view uh, progress um, a little bit differently than maybe somebody who fought uh, during the civil rights era um, in the sense that what they've experienced is completely different. Good. And one quick question is, what would you say specifically to, to, to challenge it, attack it, or deal with it? Because you a little bit you said something like we're an academic or like a third party position there. But you yourself, what would you do to make it better yourself? Dealing with racism. I have I have to do what we all have to do, which is we have to call it out. We have to address it head on. You can't step around it. If you're if you're in a position where you're able to impact policy, um, you do that. When I was uh, at Creighton Law, one of the things that I did is it, me and a number, not me alone. Me and a number of students went to the administration, went to the dean of the school, and we said, here are the things we want to see changed in, in, this, in um, the law school, because it's not, you know, we have, we have a lack of diversity. We don't have, it is not representative of the Omaha um, uh, community, um, nor is it representative of the, the nation as far as on a racial demographic scale. So that doesn't change on its own. If the students are the ones that pay the tuition, we have to demand it, and that's what we did. Yeah. So there's things like that where you can, um, you know, it's much stronger when it's in groups, but when individuals can come together and address those things head on, I think that's where you can begin to make change, but you can't do it until you start to talk about it. Good. Thank you. So, Cynthia, I had a colleague tell me once that she worked at Boys Town. I like to call these agencies and organizations out. And they were talking about race in a meeting and particularly dealing with racial issues. A white guy came up to her and told her she had no dog in the fight. He said, she said it scared him. And she also said she didn't speak out about it again. And again, one of my former colleagues at Catholic Charities told me when we did a table talk that when she speaks out directly to defend African American or other people of color, she catches hell from other white supremacy personality. And she also says sometimes it's not worth the grief. I also have a Jewish colleague who cited similar pushback on Zionist Jewish, Jewish folks. Have you experienced uh, such pushback or overt racism directed at you for defending or attacking or challenging some of the things in our society, yourself? You're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Yeah, so I've, I've lived, I think I've lived in like 18 or 19 states. In the Midwest, in my experience, especially Omaha, has just a lot of um, 
ignorant toxicity when it comes to diversity. And when, when I say ignorance, I, I mean that is a lack of understanding, knowledge, and awareness. And nearly all your leadership positions there in Omaha, from school system to government um, to organizations, are led by white people who who just are unaware. They don't have the knowledge. So the experience that you have, Ajmal, in various organizations you've been in Omaha, it doesn't surprise me. And the, I, I don't know if it's overt. I think there's more covert racism um than than over it's like this covert nebraska nice racism where the white person is is unaware and they they think they're being nice but they're really being kind of caustic and passive aggressive and and this is be, is just rooted in total ignorance as far as pushback as a white person i i didn't notice it until i began making others uncomfortable and that's i think that's the real big key there is when when as when another white person makes another white person feel uncomfortable, that's when some issues start happening. So if a black person makes a white person feel uncomfortable, zoom, you know, the white person runs away. If a white person makes another white person comfortable, that's when the tension really comes. And as far as the dog in the fight comment, you know, during COVID, uh, my bubble of 10 people it included four African Americans. And and we became family. And um, sadly, I was just in Omaha for the funeral of Yano Jones, who was like a dad to my son, who, who was, who, I mean, very close. And that's when a white person has a dog in the fight. It becomes personal. So when you become, when you care and love someone, it doesn't matter what color of skin they are or, or disability or sexual orientation, what, whatever. When you care and you love someone, grief just isn't measurable because they're your family. And so it's worth the grief to help educate others. Good. Cindy, I'm going to ask you, what do you know about John Brown's effort to end the enslavement of Africans and fight during his time in the mid 1800s? And do you know if there are any other modern John Brown types who work to inspire the lives of people of color or social justice people who deal with issues? And you can answer that in any way you want. I'm going to bring back the farmer because... <laughs> Go ahead. Because I am a farmer daughter. <laughs> um, um, what I knew about John Brown was that he was white and that he was um, fighting for anti-slavery. That's about it. And I also know that he was um, accused of it in treason and that they hung him or they killed him. By getting this question from you, Ajmal, I ended up finding out I have a lot in common because he was a farmer's son and he was sent off to school just like i was all along highway 91 all the catholic schools that were coming up I, my parents send us off to him so john brown and i have that in common um very catholic family he was from a very puritan background religiously and an evangelical christian very strong conviction he and he actually felt called by god to um get rid of this this is his sacred obligation to take up arms and there's all kinds of stories around how he did that and the most famous one of course is that he had a group of a uh, small band of flower followers at a quaker um, farm in virginia and it failed at harper's ferry he did not succeed in his rebellion so his uh, call and I'm going to bring forward to answer the second part of the question I'm going to bring forward John Boyd who is the National Black. Um, my dad was in the NFL, which is the National Farmers Organization, and the Blacks were in the National Black Farmers Organization. And John Boyd, there's a whole bunch of good stories about him, but my favorite is that he took his mule and um, his mule's name was Justice and his tractor was Justice. And he ended up in Washington, D.C., fighting to defend the um, to get the money that was already allocated. It wasn't there, but he wanted to have the discrimination lawsuit that had been um, brought forward. That's another whole history. But the fact that my dad was active in the National Farmers Organization fighting for good pricing for uh, farmers and uh, that Boyd was doing the same thing. The black farmer could not get a USA don't, um, you know, um, the Bureau of it's USDA, the Department of Agriculture, they couldn't get loans. And John tells the story of going to get a loan for himself and they wait, white farmers come and go, come and go. 
and the black farmers are denied the, the loan. So I bring forward him as somebody who's very active. And at this point, I haven't heard that he's accused of treason. I'm sure people say things, but he's um, kind of like the John Brown of the farmer world. Appreciate that. Thank you. Right. I want to ask you. Often when I ask for racial demographics from the Douglas County Administration, City of Omaha, the Omaha Plantation Schools, white officials are reluctant or will not share such information. Can one infer that public institutions that do not have people of color on their boards or in management staff are inherently racist? Uh, sure, I suppose one can infer that. I think more importantly than the people who make up the boards, perhaps, or the actual the outcomes uh, of such institutions, right? So um, let's pretend we have a, an institution, um, a public institution, it could be a school board um, in a, um, a city uh, that has a much higher uh, black demographic than Omaha, and everyone on the school board is black. If there are still um, outcomes which are showing that black children are not receiving, um, don't have get as good of an outcome from the school, from that, um, school system, then um, the system is inherently racist, racist regardless of who's at the top, who's who's running the board. So that may be the case. Um, um, it's often the case. It is the case. But uh, I think it's important also that we are we're ensuring that um, just because somebody who is not white sits on a board, that as long as they are carrying water for uh, in a racist institution and they're not changing okay. things, they're not. The other, the other uh, question, so I'm just jumping here to sister, do whites, as as in the case of other racial groups, have an obligation for working on anti-racism or race equity on our site to address it within their circle? In other words, can we use the concept of prejudice plus power equals racism for men? So again, it's a little bit more of a complex question, but again, how do we, again, deal that within our own circles? Um, I want to thank you for this question because it led me into some education. I'm one of those computer trained people. Um, this formula of prejudice plus power equals racism sounds like it came out of some other part of history. And I struggled with the meaning of it because I kept asking, so what kind of racism? Um, personal, interpersonal, institutional, systemic, economic, structural? And my mind just got tired of trying to figure out what the formula could possibly mean. So I Googled the question that Ajmal asked, and I ended up at an Oxford University Press published article, which if anybody's interested, I can pass it on. But in his eight pages, he argued that the prejudice plus power view is unsatisfying. On a moral issue, on moral basis, those theories, it doesn't hold up and it doesn't hold up for political. So I go back to my understanding, which is I'll change the formula. And I changed it to prejudice plus, plus power brings resistance. I'm very involved in the, um, I'll call it the solidarity with the Palestinians for their dignity and the right to a state. And their resistance is subtle, it's violent, it's all kinds of different things. And this is how I'd like to end with this comment um, from the article in Oxford University. This guy who wrote the uh, analysis, he said, racism must involve the prejudice coming from a member of a privileged racial group and directed towards an oppressed or underprivileged racial group. Racism, I'll repeat, must involve the prejudice coming from a member of a privileged racial group and directed toward an oppressed or underprivileged racial group. Then he says, it involves the leverage of that societal power as a form of oppression. And then he goes on to talk about hatred and bias toward another can be backed up by power of the society and then the whites in our culture, the whites and the wealthy benefit. So they use the societal political power and they can oppress everybody else. Oh, so thank, you. That. thank you. Cynthia, I want to, I want to ask you, our so-called diversity, we have so-called diversity, equity, inclusion, or they call the word DEI programs must be revised. And oftentimes they're taught by individuals with little or no training in the field. And I know a few of them here in Omaha who really took a course and they call themselves experts. What should be the standards to teach about racial or cultural experience from your perspective? Yeah, I like this question because um, I've been with the university since 2008 
and our our DEI training has become like a check the block exercise and it's outsourced to an automated webinar type training and there's no interaction necessary and you can just easily fast forward to the end and receive the mandatory certificate. Um, so none of the trainings I've experienced include that comprehensive understanding of the historical context of race, including colonialism, slavery, segregation, talk about the civil rights movement. And I think learning the past and its ramifications helps a white person to understand the long-term impact, especially trauma um, of the histories of on, on the current social structures. So to me, what's missing in the DI programs is like a mirror, a mirror for, for personal and institutional reflection, which will lead to self-awareness. And, and that goes back to my understanding of, of whiteness because self-awareness um, helps keep the ego rooted in this healthy non-dualistic mode that brings to light racial and cultural identities and biases and privileges without the ego feeling like it has to protect and defend itself. Um, you mentioned the standards. Um, I think looking at the policies and practices and cultural norms within one's organizations and then implementing measurable metrics for evaluating the effectiveness of DI programs is important. Like right now I'm involved in a curriculum review for the university. And um, of course we can also measure by seeing that we have more faculty, um, diverse faculty, diverse staff in that way. And the qualifications, um, you know, a person can, can have a major in black studies, Asian studies, women's studies, but just still not get it. Um, so I think lived experience is important and then being involved in the local community. I think those two factors are, are crucial. I'd rather have someone that's involved and in leading in communities and someone that's got a PhD in diversity. Yeah, we're kind of at the end. I want to give the panel members a chance to either ask each other questions or come back for a rejoinder or whatever else they want to say. So anyone want to say anything related to any of the comments before we open it up to the other participants? Any other closing or things you want to say before we move it over? Yeah, I just wanted to touch real quick on the question um, earlier that you had um, about ethnic identities, such as being Irish, Italian, Greek, and whatnot. And um, I just thought it was worth noting that um, I think oftentimes when we when we talk about um, discrimination, um, a lot of people who are really resistant to say that um, well, resistant to accept that discrimination exists on a, on a racial basis today in a lot of different ways will then point back to well, you know, the Italians used to get a lot of discrimination back, you know, when they first came here and and and, uh, and the Irish did too, they weren't able to apply for certain jobs. And I think the thing that we have to remember about white privilege is that over time, those groups that had, a white, had white identities were able to slowly give up their ethnic identities and ethnic cultures in order to assimilate and into their, with their whiteness. And that was able, and that allowed them to be able to be a part of the dominant culture. And that is something that um, uh, a black person from Somalia cannot come to the United States and just give up their ethnic culture and then be uh, assimilated into the dom the dominant culture um, uh, because they are black, and so they because they don't have that privilege um, because of the way they present. So um, I just thought it was worth noting that we that we acknowledge that, and that's just kind of a really good way to think about how uh, white privilege gives us that ability to do that where others do not have it. Good, appreciate that. Thank you. Any any of the other two panel members before we open it up? Any other comments? I I would just want to, what you said, Riley, is, is my experience with teaching when I uh, taught GED and then when I teach English language to uh, adults, some of my volunteer work, because if the students were from Africa, they had a, a it's like they listen to some of the experiences. And the one I would like to bring forward is I was teaching down at Creighton on the, uh, anyway, I was teaching down there on 20th. And one of the students, one of the black American black students came and she was just physically shaking. And so we just took time to deal with what she had experienced. And the students who were from, I, I don't remember if it was Kenya or, or Sudan, but 
it was like they were puzzled by the fact that why would she be so afraid that a cop pulled her over? <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't articulate because she... you're starting to fade in. Your 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 uh, bandwidth is messing up, so we have to switch over. Anyone else? Okay. So I guess we're going to switch over to go to uh, Cynthia. Did you want to say anything, Ramirez? Anything you want to say before we move over? No, but it's kind of like what Sister Cynthia was saying. Um, and she looks frozen. Oh, there she is. Okay. So it was brought up. It was brought up when you and I were teaching how um, a gentleman from Haiti didn't understand why people were treating him a certain way because of the color of his skin because he he didn't grow up with all of that in America but as soon as he came here it's like he ingested all that um and so that's that to me is is very powerful yeah so folks at this point we're going to open it up to the participants comments feedback anything you want to say and again un unmute your mic as they say and say what you need to say and Ron I saw your hand was up for a long time did you want to say something Ron it was up in the beginning. I moved it down, Ron. Your mic, your own mic, your mic is uh, muted. No, I didn't know I had my hand up. I yeah, I moved know. it down, but I, I thought maybe you wanted to tell me I was saying something or doing something. Okay, it was up for a while. I didn't know if you had it. I know you did fight with the forum community because you're from a real forum community yourself. So I didn't know if you, you wanted to share something on that also. Yeah. Well, I, I liked what. Uh... Cynthia Ramirez said, I mean, it's the lived experience. And I guess that's what, that's how people change, I think, is once you lived in uh, and experience people of different cultures that you begin to understand. And also the dualistic thinking that we, we're we ingrained with needs to change. Yeah. Other feedback, other reactions, other people. While we're waiting, I would like to uh, come back to the um, experience of the story that gets passed on, like in my little family story. But the Catholic Church has not a very good record on this topic. Over the 267, 65 popes, it took a long time and many coming up with the idea of slavery is wrong, but it just couldn't get... Um, it couldn't get out of the system. And I would like to point out that when I read the book, All Oppression Shall Cease, I started par partnering it with the book, The Color of Law, because the Catholic Church became so much a part of the culture that slavery was kept being rationalized. You know, it's like if you treat them nicely and it goes on and on. But the book, All Oppression Shall Cease, is the history of slavery, abolition, and the Catholic Church. And I think that I'm, I admire many who try to change that history, but we have a, a lot of changing to make and some confession to admit. Yeah, thank you. Other feedback? Oh, okay. uh, law, law students are the ones that could benefit from both of those books. They could benefit. Good, thank you. Other questions, other reactions? We may have to end a little bit early. I'm not, I'm not opposed, but yeah. You know, one of the one of the things that I find fascinating, and the reason I even invited all of y'all to talk about this, is that very rarely do people of color get the chance to hear white folks talk about race uh, in a in a in a in an open way. And at most of our institutions, we don't get that. And so I find it fascinating that again, this is not afforded to folks, and we have not developed environments in our institutions, whether it be education. I'm not going to call out UNO Creighton or elsewhere, uh, the Omaha Public Schools or whatever. But there's very few opportunities that people of color get to hear white folks talk about their interpretation of race or racial identities, or even growing up white and so on. And so this was one of the kind of a few times I've done this. And at one time, uh, Cynthia and I did something at First United Methodist Church where I invited my seven white friends on a panel to talk about their experience dealing with race issues. But it is rare. And I do know that when I've taught courses, students would oftentimes respond and say, we don't get that. It usually you come and you get lectured to and read the book and you walk away, but you never get to hear how white people 
learn their identities or racial identities and so on. So I find this very uniquely good and also wonderful that we can do this. But other feedback, people there, people on the sidelines quiet who may want to say something, I'm gonna let you say something. There's a comment in the chat. Okay, comments. Somebody, okay, the question is, Kemi, I have a question comment. Much of what the panel shared in their answers internalized internalize the experience of whiteness and white supremacy, but I didn't hear many personal acknowledgement of how you personally have contributed to the issues of whiteness and white superiority and what you personally are doing introspectively, not externally to address this. Wow. Someone like to address that one. Boy, I appreciate that, Kim. That's a good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for that. I, I think, um, ooh, that's a loaded one. Until I read, I didn't read James McBride's book, Color of Water, till I was in seminary. So we're talking like 1999. I did read the book in the early 90s called Black Like Me that at least had me realize that there was a difference. And I look back and I can, I can sadly talk about situations I would have handled a lot differently a lot differently and so once I realized that I was a very privileged person I I saw things from a different perspective and then as a as a white person there's there's a, a place where you, you you don't want to be the white savior you just want to be I that's why I go back to relationships you just um to me everything's about about the relationships and have I always done the right thing, even being aware? No, I was, I was talking in our um, our book group the other day. I was in Richmond two weekends ago at a conference, and the presenter was um, showing slides about all the educators who, and they were all white and everything. And I noticed it right away, no women, uh, no people of color. And it was about plant medicine, so it should have been like a lot of pictures of of native uh, Native Americans and especially shamans. But I was going to be like, you know, I should raise my hand and say something, but I didn't want to make the person presenting, who was an older white gentleman, uncomfortable. So I didn't say anything. And the gal next to me was African American, and as soon as it was question and answer, her hand went up, and she called the presenter out and I just sat there and I'm like, you know, even with what I know, I still, I still mess that up. And that's just a small example. Um, I was aware and I still didn't do anything. And, and so it's, it is, it, it's a struggle shouldn't be, but um, it, it is in my job right now, though, I, I am really working hard to change the curriculum and change at graduation our our student population is probably 60 70 percent african-american latino 30 percent white and it's it's kind of embarrassing to me at graduation when the people on the stage all the senior administrations don't reflect that um same diversity it's it's probably more like 70 percent white 30 percent um african-american latino latina so um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Any other feedback, other questions, other comments? Someone read on there, Laura, you had a must read Charles Mill of Blackness Visible. Very good. Any I questions? Just wanted, I just wanted to add on to that as well. Um, because I um I, I like this question here from Cami. Um I think for me, it was the same what I think what I'm hearing from everyone on the panel here is that none of us um learned ourselves until there was some there was some uh, there was a catalyst moment that happened for us before we realized the, the privilege that we have and um i i don't want to speak for anyone else on the panel but nobody else nobody in my home talked to me about what it means to be white or what i what i received for being white and so that's how i moved around the world for much of my life and it wasn't until my 20s when I started to, to uh, when I start noticing um, police killings that are being um, put in the media more, that I started to to kind of take a step back and be like, well, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem fair. And then you start reading more and, and trying to learn more. 
and just trying to take in more information. And so um, I, which led me to understand much later in my life that um, the depth of the privilege that I have, and then, um, and much like what Cynthia said, like it makes you kind of reflect and think back and about the things um, that you would have done differently in different situations. Um, and I say, and I say that as somebody who considered myself to be a liberal, but then also realizing all the blind spots that I have had for a long time. To that, to that point as well, it's also part of the reason I don't like when people self-assign the term ally as if it's some achieved status. If you get a badge, you get to just wear it, and then you're just, I'm an ally now because I call myself one. Like, I, I think we're constantly having to learn more because we don't, as white people, we don't have that lived experience. So all we're doing is trying to better understand the lived experience. And then and then from that understanding, try to figure out how do we deconstruct it? How do we reverse policies, not just um, tear down policies, but also reverse them to try to um, better um, create more equitable outcomes um, for people. So, yeah. and I don't, I don't know if that fully answers your question, Tammy, yeah, but I, I think sure. there's a lot of internal work that goes into it yeah. for me. Anyway. Thank you. I would like to, uh... Um, I'm pondering what you asked, Cami, and I'm not, I'm hoping I'm understanding. But issues of whiteness and white supremacy, you personally are doing introspectively. And I was thinking about this past Lent. I chose to read um, Cone's book, uh, James Reverend James Cone's "The Cross and the Lynching Tree," and I entered his struggle with dealing with how the white Bible messages came across. And his experience, and I'm, I, I know I can't get into it, but it, it just helped me really look at how do I experience the gospel? How do I experience Jesus who came for the oppressed? So out of my religious life and my um, training, I mean, I, I read about all the saints and how they suffered and how the systems often oppress them, but it's it's like the this whiteness and the privilege throughout history. Um, I need to read more people like Cohen, you know, and I, I, I'm just needing to keep listening, I guess is what I want to say. And I'll share another personal experience that I keep pondering. And that is, again, back to the farm issue. I had gone home and I was sharing with my family the things I learned about the 40 acres and a mule and about how farmers who were black could not get the loan from the USDA. And the atmosphere changed around the table. We were just, you know, eating popcorn or something. And and they said, so why are you always defending the black? Are we supposed to be giving up our land for them? And I'm going, wait a minute. I mean, I, I had, a, I really pulled back and I tried to listen to what was their experience as farmers who were not the big corporate farming and the things they were dealing with. But the race issue um, was more of a, I don't know, it just put me into more of the reflection. So I just wanted to add that for my dealing with my rural background. Thank you, appreciate it. Other feedback, other this reactions, is, go ahead. This is Karen, can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay, I'm not, it's weird being on the phone. Uh, I've never done this before, but um, yeah, I always say that um, aging is not for the faint of heart, but one of the advantages of getting older for me in terms of anti-racist activism is I just am getting to a point where I don't care what what people think anymore and um, that is freeing in terms of my ability to actually say what I think and not and not you know in terms of standing standing up for anti um standing up for uh anti being anti-white supremacist and and um fighting for what's right in the world um it just i do think <laughs> i do think that uh part of what comes with the territory of aging is losing you know as ajmal would say <laughs> i've lost my filter a little bit and uh and i think that's a good thing and um so I'm I'm looking forward to uh, being even more unfiltered in the future, because I think um, we, in order in order to do this work, we need to be talking to our white friends 
and families and communities and working to change policies and practices uh, in the workplace. Uh, you know, that's why I find myself doing a lot of work is in the workplace. Um, really trying to point out when um, white supremacy is raising its ugly head. Uh, and and I just I just don't care anymore. You know, if somebody is going to fire me, they're going to fire me. But um, I think that uh, that piece of being bold um, with words and actions um, needs to happen, and it does take practice. We just have to keep on practicing, and I think that we're going to screw up. We're going to screw up. We're going to uh, tread on people's toes. We're going to we're going to be racist when we think we're being anti racist. And that's OK, because it's a journey. We just have to keep on doing it. The more practice that we have, the better we get at it, like everything else. Yeah, that's it yeah. for me. Thank you. You know, Karen, as you share that, one of the things There's two things. One of the things. Number one, years ago, Franklin Thompson was in a meeting and and he was saying something about sometimes why do black people always be around themselves and so on and like and they eat together in the cafeteria in high school and elsewhere and he used the term white people fatigue and so i throw that out because after working most of my career in white organizations i have a burnout i get tired of raising my hand or being the only one in the room and nothing is more debilitating or angry when i see black folks or hispanics or asians or native american whoever keep quiet and then when you raise the issue, you get into the door, then they want to get in on your fumes of what you do. And so the reason I share that, because it needs a lot of us at the table. And oftentimes whites will go and bring in the most docile, incompetent people and say, we won't hire incompetent people, but they don't do the deliver. But the point I really want to lead to is I asked all my white friends, can you name three times in the past year that you've spoken out against racism or dealt with something of someone who's different from you? Again, you name it. And it's amazing the number of folks who cannot name any time that they've gone out on a limb. I'm not saying doing tokenistic thing, but something that you've done to help others who are less fortunate. And it could be even poverty. And so one of the things I think we do a much better job is how do we help the others who are different from us? But also let's ask ourselves once a year, can we at least check the box that we've done something? And it's amazing. Some people can't say anything and some can say a lot. So I think we need to ask ourselves those questions. But I really appreciate you sharing that because, again, a lot of us don't hear this thing that we all go through as journeys as, as human beings to change and make our society much more inclusive. So yeah, thank you. Folks, we got a, probably about uh, another five minutes or so. We started late, but is there anybody who wants to say something for the sake of this? And we may edit just a little bit, particularly in the beginning, because we didn't get everything smoothly in, but we uh, would like to give you a chance, anyone to say some other stuff for the record. And uh, if this goes viral and we become millionaires, I might share some of the money with you for more. <laughs> Right, I see you smiling over there. <laughs> Any other feedback? Anything else, folks? Anything else you want to share? This is the first. I want you to know that. And I would love to do this more often in a much more informal way with other groups and so on. But yeah. Any other reactions, other thing before we do anything? I see another some other comment. Any other comments? We do have an evaluation up there. And Laura, you have some resources. A religious approach in the 21st day of racial equality and challenge. Lord, did you want to say something? You and I had a wonderful event at something over at Creighton. I'm putting you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, here, let me see. Sorry. Yeah, um, you, you and I had a wonderful experience at something we did at Creighton. I, I just thought that was very good that I got invited back to Creighton after all those years under your auspices and so on. It was wonderful. And also, we did a show. We did a show about your experience in Africa, Rwanda, which was excellent. We love that. So, well, and I mean, uh, this has been really, this has been a great panel. So, thank you, Ajamal, for for putting this together because um, folks, white folks, don't talk about race as much, even though it impacts white folks too, right? Mm -hmm. um, that it doesn't, it doesn't get. Everybody works together to get it dismantled, right? Um, but uh, one of the things that we talked about um, with with all sorts of um, ways to engage people in dialogue is just how to get folks to just look at the world that they know and understand 
through other perspectives, right? Um, and so we've talked about it in the classroom, like what happens if you start a uh, international relations class where students are expecting to talk about the world and you start with the Stono Rebellion or Stono Uprising in South Carolina and talk about how um, global race relations and race relations in the US ends up impacting so much more beyond that event, right? Um, and so any kind of opportunity like this is awesome. So thank you. And for the panelists, you all were really great. Oh, you went mute on us. Lip, lip syncing, you went mute. Okay, good. Any other, anybody else want to say anything before we leave? Because I'll, I'll close out if there's no other comments or anything. Anything um, else? Yes, of course. Cynthia found something to say. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Come on, go over pile. Guess what? Who got to? Okay. I, I would, I would be, um, not honoring what I believe if I didn't lift up uh, Father John Marcou, who started the Marcou House in that group. And um, just because he's a white man who who dared to cross Cumming Street and go and look for what he could really do about the issues on racism. The second person I want to lift up is, um, it's just this book by um, Preston Love. And I happened to pick up his book because I had cataract surgery recently and it didn't go well. So I'm like, tap dealing with that but his image of um from cataracts to new horizons i happen to open to page 77 and he's um with a group of teens and they were sharp and focused he said we broke the youth into teams and they studied about african americans and he said by the third and fourth days we the planners i guess realized that not only were we teaching african american history and culture we were teaching character, responsibility, accountability, and interpersonal relation skills. And then upon reflection, he says, we also realized that the youth were watching us pray. So I kind of like that. And he goes on. But I I um, learned a lot also from Preston Love. So Ajmal and Preston were my two early mentors back in 2013. <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you. Well, folks, no other comments. Uh, there's a Laura. He has another book out here on the on the web. The book Wilford and the White Carnation and the Omaha Star founder, Free Radical on Ernie Chambers are great. Oh, so good. Thank you. Any other comments before we close out? Well, folks, I'd like to thank you very much for participating today, and hopefully, we can do this again. And again, I think it's an opportunity that is rare in our city to do that, and I wish more institutions would do that. I want to make a couple of shameless plugs. We're going to try to bring more of these discussions, not only from our board members, but other people in the community. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to have Dr. D Donna Pope, who's uh, with the Indian uh, Health Coalition and so on. And we're going to have her talk about some of her experiences related to working with Native Americans, but also her long history of working in the community and in state government, dealing with trying to deal with social justice. And so we're going to bring her on to talk about uh, some of her experience of being a, a, a social justice warrior and she at one point was a board member of more so we're kind of excited uh that she can come and talk to us about some of her experience of bringing some of those racial groups together the other person we're going to have an interview with is Washelle Davis, one of our board members who works with voter education. She works with a nonprofit, and she's also trying to help get people uh, who have left the institutions who are they call re returning citizens or people who have been in prison uh, more involved in public policy. So we're going to talk to her a little bit more about that and give her a chance to do that. So we're going to be looking forward to bringing other people's voices to the table that we don't traditionally hear in our local media. But also, as I've said earlier, a lot of folks will watch our programs after the fact on Facebook. Facebook or on our web page. And so we think these questions are important and they will also give other institutions and people the impetus to do more of these conversations and so on. And Moore is really committed to dealing with racial equity and anti-racism. And so we see a place for us to help transform this city on the hill. So on that note, we'd like to say thank you for watching us today and being a part of this wonderful panel. As we always end, may the force be with you. Barocco.